questions from the public before we go on uh, to the, the recap? Any and all questions? We can do a recap first. All right. So first, we have this uh, viz we wanted to show you. I think it is uh, super exciting because I didn't have to write it. Uh, let me switch over to it and try to share it. Are you going to try and share your screen? Yeah, but I already fucked up. I mean, just some watch, random watch, an, watch an expert hacker use uh, learn how to use Discord. This is, gamer, man. this is for gamers. Dude, you cut your teeth writing like muds and stuff, so I think there's a clear line for you from yeah, it should hold game the hacker. That's where DevCon should 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 have gone. Alright, hold on. I managed to just <laughs> one sec. Is it not letting you share the screen? No, that's not the problem. I, yes, I have I have to redact <laughs> all of the, the, the information on the screen. Yeah, it is. Fair <laughs> enough. We didn't think about this. We didn't think this through all the way, but I'm almost there. Uh, so I guess I can talk a little bit. Do people? Does anybody out here have no idea what CTF is or how CTF works? Or are you all CTFers who are trying to look for hints? Well, probably if they are here and don't know that, they probably don't want to speak up and say, hey, I'm a noob. Although we're all noobs, especially Adam. Yeah, that's definitely true. So uh, welcome, everyone. We're the Order of the Overflow. We are run DEF CON CTF. Uh, there's a lot of CTFs at, uh, at DEF CON, but this one is ours. So we uh, basically, the idea is we have qualification events in usually in the May timeframe. And so last year, I think we had 1,700 teams from around the world that competed in our qualification event. And the top 16 teams were invited, usually invited to come to Las Vegas to compete head to head in a CTF. Uh, and so uh, there's basically two different types of capture the flag events. So the qualification event we run in May is an attack is a jeopardy style CTF, which uh, you can check out one of our scoreboards. Uh, let me actually, Oh, I don't even think I can share, man. I'm trying to vamp for you, but so I will drop this in CTF discussion text. Uh, so this is a link to our scoreboard from 2020 so that game ran straight for 48 hours and we started with no challenge opened and opened up challenges kind of slowly over time and so um then from there the top uh teams you can check out the scoreboard i mean it's crazy how good these teams are and how many challenges they solve so the top 16 teams here along with some pre-qualification events we have they were um invited to compete in the final event and so Jeopardy style CTFs just kind of have challenges and the idea is everyone's attacking the same service. So a challenge will have some intentional vulnerability. Maybe it's a website, maybe it's a custom binary service. But the idea is that as organizers, we write something that has one vulnerability and that may be a super cool way of exploiting something. And then the team and players have to identify that vulnerability and exploit it in order to steal a flag. So that's where the whole notion of capture the flag comes from. And this is different from attack defense CTFs, which is what Jan's going to talk about in a second, where basically the idea is we're trying to, all the teams are essentially running, you can think of virtual machines that are identical, and they're each running the same vulnerable services that we wrote. So it's not like a... These are, again, custom services. It's not like we took a, a version, an old version of a Bind or something that has a vulnerability and you can just run Nmap and uh, Metasploit against it. 
I mean, these are custom pieces of software that the teams have to analyze, identify for vulnerabilities, and then launch exploits at all the other teams to steal their flag. And then they give the flag to, the flag to us, and then we give them points. Uh, so that's kind of the rundown at the high level. You want to jump in? The high level, exactly. Um, there's actually two types of, of challenges we have in uh, our game. One is this type where you steal flags from each other. Uh, the other is called King of the Hill. It was invented um, sometime in the mid-2010s in Japan uh, and has been adopted in other competitions, including ours. The idea is that competitors try to beat each other in terms of the optimality of uh, their approach. This makes sense from an algorithmic perspective, right? If you want to write a faster sort algorithm, you can imagine a sort algorithm competition was the same with hacking. Uh, right now we have a king of the hill challenge running. We'll talk about that is a Las Vegas blackjack casino with a crazy twist. So I had mentioned this is uh, what I'm streaming right now is the, um, the quals uh, board is a little chaotic. Um, we had a whole bunch of challenges uh, that the teams really uh, attacked. The scoreboard really um, drives this home. Basically, this is the qualifying round. So the top uh, N teams of this, um, along with what winners. Ugly of emojis. What is this? Linux? Yeah, man, this is what oh, you should do. Is this what happens when you live in, in the Linux life? Uh, oh, yeah, exactly. You see yeah, how those do this? good, good Apple emojis, man. Yeah. Anyways, Linux hating aside, um, all, all hackers run Linux, by the way. It's true. Um, the, the top team here solved like, I don't know, I can't even count this with my level of sleep deprivation, but a lot of challenges, right? Uh, and these are, are tricky. We had, have had challenges in the past that teams have burned real, like, zero-day vulnerabilities worth real deal money uh, to kind of shortcut, right? So it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Um, this is what our game looks like right now. So let me uh, refresh this, and we'll just kind of go from the beginning. Oh, thank God, that server's still up. All right, so we started in tick one, of course, uh, at about 4 a.m., 5 a.m. this morning, Vegas time. Nothing happened for a while. And then Casino Life started getting solutions. Um, Casino Life is a blackjack simulator uh, written using a computer environment, a computing environment developed in Conway's Game of Life. It is a really crazy thing. Um, we can't talk too much in depth because the challenge is still going. It's still active. We'll talk about it when it uh, goes down in the next public recap after that. But you can see teams started kind of pulling away from each other um, in uh, Game of Life. So you, you, you see people that are really good at the casino. People are bad at the casino. And then you just saw um, what is basically PPP, a very famous uh, heavy hitting team in the scene, pull ahead uh, temporarily because they started exploiting a different challenge um, that we released called Rorschach. Uh, Rorschach is a machine learning challenge. Um, oh, none of the endpoints are accessible right now, are they, Adam? Say that uh, again? Not with my setup. All right. Um, Adam, do you want to... Uh... Oh, you can't share your screen, right? It's not working? Uh, I know I haven't enabled it yet. I have to okay. give it, you know, as security people, we always say the best thing you should just do is give an application all of the permissions that it requests of you. So let me just type in my loop, man. password and give, you know, an application like Discord the permission to record my screen, which there's absolutely no way that that could ever go wrong. But I do need to quit Discord and reboot it to get back. So actually, Adam, do you see my screen? Yes, I can see. No, I can see the browser window, so I can see. Okay, yeah, uh, Antonio is. Is, is a massive noob. It's okay. All right. From the, twi the Twitch stream can't see it, but you know what? Well, You're on Twitch Discord. Stream. Discord's where it's at. This is where DefCon's happening. So I'll yeah. be right back. This is where DefCon is happening. All right. So um, three challenges. I'll talk about two of them because they've been uh, you know solved to a, to a, a point where at least I can talk about them at a high level. Casino. I already mentioned blackjack. Game and game. Like the other one is Rorschach. 
Uh, it's a machine learning challenge. So in recent years, uh, the field of machine learning security um, has skyrocketed in importance. One of the things that I personally wanted to accomplish um, in our tenure as, as the host of DEF CON CTF um, is the creation of a real category of machine learning challenges in Capture the Flag. I started this out on our first qualifiers. I had two machine learning challenges, one called Atom Tune, where players had to uh, create um, impersonations of Adam, who just uh, left to restart Discord. And then uh, the other challenge was Flaxifier, where players had to uh, perform what is called a training set inference attack. They were given a trained model, and they were needed to recover the types of images that were used to train the model. So the model would recognize, in this case, images of, of letters, and then they would uh, figure it out. Hey, nice. The next year, last year, um, at finals, I created a, a channel called AI Han Solo, where I, which was an attack defense version of this training set inference attack, where teams had to tweak their models to make them unattackable. Um, this year, I created Rorschach, which is a slightly different twist on uh, ML Challenge. We'll, I'll talk about it when it is. And the artificial brain, it turns out, is extremely foolable and has been a lot of several years of research now showing just how fucked we are uh, as a society relying on, on these things, right? So you have examples of where people can slap a, a sticker on something and, uh, and a stop sign and it'll get misclassified as, as a, you know, not a stop can, sign. Can you all see my screen? So I can talk about casino life. I just pulled it up. Oh, brilliant. All right. Yeah, I can see it. Cool. Awesome. So yeah, so this is a challenge created by one of the Overflow members, Casino Life. And obviously, this isn't the challenge itself. This is a visualization of the game. So one of the cool things, we can go back to an earlier round, like round 13, and it will play. And so the interesting thing, as you're seeing this, you can see that there's a number of players at this table. And wow, you can see that there's a lot of people who, even if you don't know Blackjack, they're very bad at Blackjack. So lost, 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 push lost, right? All these people did really, really poorly at Blackjack. And so if you wonder, well, why are they so bad at Blackjack? Well, we can actually see there's a nice link in here to the dealer's brain. So let's go look at the dealer's brain. Can y'all see this? Can I get a thumbs up, Jan, or something? Okay, I can't see. Okay, cool. So this is now... So what we're looking at here, this is actually... Um, we started this and I don't want to give, I'm not going to give too much away, so I'm not going to go into this, but this should be very familiar with people who played our qualification event um, because there was a challenge where teams got access to something that looks very similar to this. And what they discovered was this was people had it have implemented a CPU entirely in Conway's game of life. So if you're not familiar with the game of life, it's a, how would you describe it? Actually? I don't, I'm, I can make something up, but I don't know if that's the most accurate way. No, yeah. Um, so the game of life was this exercise basically in um, the most interesting uh, physical simulation you could create with the minimum amount of rules. So the game of life basically has two rules. One is when a square dies, and the other one is when a square is born. Um, and from that, just by iterating through, you can create complex um, concepts. The idea yeah, so was, right now I'm I'm going through Jan and I'm showing kind of some examples from the Google search of yeah. oh there we go there's a GIF nice so you can see kind of things moving and it has this appearance of life like complex behaviors emerge from very simple patterns exactly and then um, kind of to uh, add some history to this cha uh, challenge direct history. A couple of years ago, there was a Stack Overflow challenge and uh, the Code Golf Stack Overflow to create Tetris in the game of life. So people have implemented some cool stuff in game of life. They've implemented, um, you know, these little like glider things, which are like little guys that, that just fly forward, uh, self-propagating. They've created shooters, which are guns, generators that create gliders. They've created a bunch of different stuff. 
Uh, and this code golf challenge challenged them to create Tetris. And this was possible because some crazy people have created logic gates in, in Game of Life. And that's all we need, as we've seen time and time again in crazy, weird machines that come up in Magic the Gathering games, in uh, Minecraft, all kinds of stuff uh, you can build. So kind of, I mean, I honestly don't know very little about this challenge because I did not design it, but you can kind of see in the lower left region here a bunch of things of what looks essentially like memory, right? You have what looks like kind of that pattern that you would expect of like physical bits memory. And essentially, people figured out all the things that you need to represent things to mimic a digital circuit. So you can see there's like buses through the system where bits can go from one place to the other, just like they do on the actual physical chips of silicone that are running in your system. You have memory units, so they'll store either a one or a zero. And again, the crazy thing is, remember, I think it's something like, I don't know if Eric's on this call, but uh, something like each dot in here, this yeah. like green or red or blue yeah. thing. 2048 yeah, by 2048 pixels each yeah, pixel each, each pixel in this image yes exactly is 2000 by 2000 game of life thing um and so they different things represent ones different things represent zeros different things can move in and out it's all a very cool way of representing uh this and really kind of thinking about computing at a very basic level and trying to understand a machine really from the ground up and so now that we know that that's what the dealer's brain is, essentially then you can think what's happening here is the teams are not playing blackjack directly. They're uploading some something to do with this game of life and that it is playing blackjack. So let's then go. So we just looked at the earlier rounds where we can really see that everyone's just doing terrible, right? Like nobody, none of these bots understand the rules of blackjack. They don't understand. They just keep hitting which is uh, if you've ever played blackjack, just don't hit all the time. That's a very bad one. One player got lucky, player nine, and got blackjack here. But uh, besides that, they did not do very well. So if we go towards one of the later rounds, like just round 75, uh, hopefully we'll see that the teams are actually doing better here. So cards are coming out. Dealer has an 11. That's not great. 14, dealer hits on soft 14. Dealer, oh man, dealer got 21. So Nothing we could do. They all lost. But the other interesting thing is we can see that all the players bet different amounts of money so that the players are actually writing bots in this game of life logic that understand this, uh, that understand blackjack and can and essentially play it. So that's kind of where we are with that challenge. The game of life um, concept here, of course, at an abstract level, and, you know, it's, it's a game of blackjack, um, but it is kind of the latest in this long line of uh, genre of CTF challenges based on um, esoteric platforms. The idea with these esoteric platforms is to try to distill the concept of what makes a, um, you know, let's say a reverse engineer uh, at, at their core, a good reverse engineer. Is it familiarity with a given architecture? Is it the fact that some reverse engineers that I know can look at x86 assembly and they're more comfortable with it than with the C code, right? Um, or is it some deeper uh, way that their mind works? If you pull them out of x86 and you put them into game of life and suddenly there's a different computer that they have to understand or a different greater system because Adam pointed out this hardware Right, it's not just software; it's a whole hardware machine that they must understand. Um, will those skills carry through? Uh, the mission of DefCon CTF is to identify the best, fastest, most adaptable, etc., hackers, uh, and this is one of these uh, routes toward that potential identification. Um, for qualifiers, we introduced the teams to this concept of uh, Game of Life as a computing platform with two challenges. The second one I'll talk about was uh, really crazy. Um, it was called Lifebox Adventure. And actually, let me pull it up um, on our archive where you can go and play. I'll, I'll do that while you talk, Jan. You can do, I'll do okay, it. awesome. So look at
the game console implemented in Game of Life. So I mentioned the original um, challenge that led on, on the code golf stack overflow that led to the creation of this computing environment inside Game of Life was for Tetris. Uh, this takes a kind of mm. a whole step oh, further. That's What's funny. up? Nothing. Keep going. Um, this takes it a uh, little step further and implements a game console with controllers and with Adam, your your stream ended. Yep, I know. Okay, do you want me to stream archive? Oh, I'm spawning a server real quick to see if that works. Just a second. Oh, okay. Just keep going. Uh, so, um, the game console challenge from Qualls had a bootloader that did verification like a real game console on the cartridge and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and would load a game and play it. And in order to solve this challenge, the top team, uh, or the, the, sorry, the only team to solve this challenge, they created in Game of Life a, a mod chip, a hardware mod chip created in Game of Life to be able to load unsigned code into uh, the, the Game of Life um, uh, game console. It was absolutely insane. And they did this in the course of just like 24 hour crazy straight sprint on uh, ne probably never having seen Game of Life as a computing platform before to creating hardware mod chips in it. And so, you know, in, in continuing in that fashion, now that having introduced uh, teams to Game of Life, we created uh, this Game of Life challenge for finals. Um, other kind of esoteric machines that have been seen in finals, there was a uh, DEF CON CTF year where every challenge ran on this custom architecture created from scratch just for the, the CTF. This was in the uh, run by the organizers before us, Legitimate Business Syndicate. Uh, and they basically from scratch created an entire uh, type of CPU that had bytes that were nine bits long it stored data packed it in what was called middle endian it was a crazy architecture that uh the teams had to learn from scratch from the night before the competition and then hack in it right so the kind of core concept of ctf reversing or otherwise is how fast can you go from not knowing something at all to knowing it so well that you can find specific tiny corner cases and tiny ways, tiny strings you can pull to bend a program that wasn't intended to do something crazy to your will to make it do something crazy. Um, I often tell people that you take I mean, a program. The just essence no of lot. security, right, Jan? Exactly. The essence right. of security is, you know, it's a dance. You take something that was designed to walk and you teach it to dance. Um, um, as a world-class swing dancer, that really means something. Thank you. Exactly. Um, so uh, those are kind of the two challenges that we can discuss, uh, Rorschach and uh, Casino Life. The third challenge, Parallel AF. Um, Adam, do you want to mention at a high level that you didn't expect that it was quite this hard? No. Nope. I don't want to say anything about it until it's over. Uh, Adam's not going to say anything about it. So he wrote it. Um, the teams have so far uh, hammered it for eight hours, and it has uh, remained uh, completely undefeated. Um, so we're going to see uh, what happens uh, overnight. So the way that DEFCON CTF, for those that don't know, don't, that don't know usually works is uh, we start the game usually at 10 a.m. on Friday morning. All of the teams arrive, and teams arrive from all over the world, uh, really all over the world, flying in from Taiwan, from China, from Japan, uh, from Santa Barbara, you know, California, like near and far. Um, and uh, they show up usually Wednesday, Thursday, try to uh, get on jet lagged, show up on Friday to hack. Start Friday morning, we hack all day. Start Saturday morning, we hack all day or until the evening. Start Sunday morning, we hack into the clothing ceremonies. Uh, this year, because of DEF CON safe mode, with all the teams being spread out around the world, we couldn't do that. 
So we had to, uh, or we could have still done that, but then there would have been a significant part, portion of our teams that would have had nothing but night shifts for their hacking. And that's not fair. Um, they would not have been able to perform at, at 100%. So instead, we created an insane system where we have shifts of eight hours hacking, nine hours rest, eight hours hacking, nine hours rest. And no one rests between the hacking. They all, uh, I guarantee you right now, uh, these teams are hitting all of these challenges very hard trying to solve them overnight so that in the morning they can start, or morning, when the next shift starts, they can start uh, firing exploits against each other. Um, so it is a little uh, made a little even worse by the so, crazy. So what's, what's the normal time frame schedule like? Like how long do we normally go and do it? Ten hours on Friday, ten hours on Saturday, four hours on Sunday. Um, this so twenty four hours of total game time. Of total game time. So and I have the and so if you want to check all this information, so I'm streaming on. Um, uh, it's all public, so you can check all of this stuff out. Uh, our schedule here. So yeah, next shift is at 9 p.m. DEFCON time, or the setup's at 9 p.m., and then the game starts at 10 p.m. with a brutal 6 a.m. end time. Yeah, so uh, now the players can, of course, uh, have... Usually the players are not very kind to their uh, bodies as they uh, play. We've We've had people push themselves so hard uh, that uh, they passed out at their table and collapsed. Like, you know, I, I was walking back toward the, the organizer podium and I look over and there is uh, a hacker that is, uh, you know, hacking away, hacking away. And then suddenly this hacker's head just like hits their keyboard Boom. and then it just falls to the floor. I mean, because they were hacking so hard i forgot to eat drink sleep for you know way too long um so probably the same thing will happen again but the the twist now is if someone wants to catch the whole competition and doesn't want to uh you know stay up all night and so forth they don't really have a choice anymore which is very painful but you know we'll we'll soldier through this year um yeah so it's a it's a really a crazy uh, scenario um adam did the the server for lightbox successfully start oh yeah it did you want me to you want to try talking oh, to it? we have to upload a pattern so what's that what was that yeah no, I, I was just gonna say you can show this is archive.ooo you can go there right now um and uh play you know this this previous iteration of this um and I think since we're wrapping up, this goes into kind of both Jan and I's philosophy. We both, you know, Jan literally started going to DEF CON when he was 14 and somehow tricked his parents to letting him go to DEF CON. And he uh, didn't even have a hotel room, I believe, the first time they went to DEF CON. Uh, I did, but, but Odo didn't. And so, you know, wandering around CTF, I, would you call yourself a noob then? I mean, I know you'd call yourself a noob now, but... You were definitely a noob then. Well, I was a massive noob. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, uh, back then, the CTF had what was called a gray net. So uh, the, 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 the capture the flag wasn't as well defined um, as it is now. This was DEF CON 9, right? So it's almost 20 years ago. Um, You're old, man. Yeah, it's pretty bad news. Uh, back then, you could show up and plug into what was called the gray net. And the gray net was like, you know, we have 16 teams this year. The gray net would have been Team 17. And it was like a, a free-for-all. Uh, you, you had everyone plugging in, script kiddies, uh, super pros, uh, and, and et cetera. And I plug in to try to tell uh, my friend, who's also now on Order of the Overflow, um, that, hey, I'm at DEF CON, it's so cool, and so on. And, and uh, my um, AOL Instant Messenger session got sniffed. Oh. And, and uh, fairly soon, my friend, or actually my friend's friend, taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, are, are, are you Jan Shosh? I'm like, yeah. And it turns out that they were in the gray net area as well, and they were looking over the shoulder of the fucker that sniffed my Aeon's and Messenger session. And that's how they knew I was in that room and they found me. Until then, we had only 
known each other online. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a, amazing. Um, yeah, so uh, that's how I got first got into DEF CON. I thought oh, these people are like the the the, the CTF um, hackers, like the people actually, you know, scoring points. So they're they're gods. Um, now, from the other side, I realized what news we all are. Um, but it's uh, some uh, a message I always try to convey to everyone curious and interested about CTF is, uh, you know, there's absolutely guaranteed that you can do it if you put your mind to it. Yep. Um, especially, I mean, look, Adam is here. That's I, I, I didn't go to actually Jan and I met at playing DEF CON Qualls in 2008, 2009 uh, um, at UC nine. Santa Barbara in 2009. Yeah. yeah nine. And that was, I think, my very first time going to Vegas for DEF CON. So it hasn't even been that long for me. So, yeah. And honestly, I mean, the funny thing is running all this stuff, you know, and playing with these teams and everything. You know, I learned stuff today about tools and how to learn things. Like part of what we do as a group is help each other out when we're testing things or deving things or, oh, do you know this? Or do you know there's this cool feature and this kind of stuff? So, I mean, the important thing is constantly learn, get better, and you definitely will improve your skills over time. And you can be one of these amazing hackers that are, uh, you know, competing in CTFs, understanding these crazy, insane um, game of life systems. And yeah, nothing's beyond your reach. Absolutely. Anyone got any questions about CTF, about um, how, whether it's philosophically in general or how the game uh, progresses from here? Um, yeah, it's hard for us to give specifics because we obviously don't want to give any anything that could be even construed as a hint, but we would love to answer questions if we can. Absolutely. We can also ta take text questions in oh, the see, I was. Yeah, I already asked. I was going to say, just like your classes, I think people have fallen asleep. And so maybe it's time we. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, we can totally uh, wrap things up. Someone asked about pistachios in the uh, discussion text. Do you want to tell that story or do you want to leave it as a oh, 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 mystery? I'll say this. Who the fuck is pistachio? Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, on that note, you can still ask last minute questions if someone's are late. We'll, we'll, we'll chat. Otherwise, um, day one is just the beginning. No challenges have been retired, so we can't really go in details. Uh, tomorrow, and that is actually tomorrow, roughly this time, I think actually an hour later, or maybe no, maybe this time on Saturday. Yeah, we're going Saturday, Saturday, 1 p.m. We have the next uh, an hour scheduled. Later. Public We're going to go in depth into some retired challenges. Hopefully, there will be some retired challenges, and then we can. Uh, you know talk what, if these guys, if these teams just started hacking, I think we could retire some challenges. But really, I mean, it's not up to us. They have to steal the flags, Jan. We just create the challenges. Yeah, you can you you can lead a hacker to the flags, but you can't write their <laughs> exploiting system and automated flag submission. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The, the, the best thing is when you're looking at uh, the logs and you you just obviously see that someone wrote an awesome exploit and they're running it by hand instead of like scripting it to hit all the teams. Well, it's easy. You just hit up and you go back a couple, control B, so yeah. you can go a whole word, and then you change one to two to get team two. You hit enter, flag, and then you copy and paste that in the interface, and then you go team three. Yeah, I've been there, done that. We've all been there. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, a whole year where our, our uh, network analysis system. Oh, should we talk about stealth? We should oh, yeah, talk that about was the big thing you did this year. Yeah, our, our, did we had year. one year when, when we were playing where our whole network analysis system was, it wasn't even TCP dump. I mean, it was TCP dump to capture the, the and then we grepped them, just literally grep instead of actually parsing the, the packets. It was easier for a number of reasons. Um, in the CTF, you need a, uh, an attack defense CTF where you're going up against uh, really a kind of uh, mano a mano so against. I'm sharing my screen with the uh, with the info there about the PCAPs. So, oh, awesome. yeah, we're going so up previously, against... So, previously in the past, right? Previous years, 
So you get access to the data that people are sending to your service. The idea of which being you can see when people steal your flags, so you can steal your exploits and launch their exploits and launch them back at them and at other teams. So you get this, you can see this really crazy behavior that happens where one team launches an exploit and then other teams steal it. And now exploits are flying and teams are patching, trying to fix those things. So uh, in previous years, we would actually, we said, ah, let's get away from PCAPs. Let's limit the number of PCAPs and we'll only release PCAPs after a certain number of flags have been stolen for that service. Adam, can you, can you go a little bit into the reasoning behind that? Yeah, so the reasoning is, well, you know, it, it comes back to what do we want to get out of this game? Who do we want people to win this game? We want the, like Jan said earlier, the best hackers, the best, you know, mobile hackers. If you drop these people uh, into a desert island, would they be able to hack uh, sand and coconuts and trees? And I think yes, based on how resourceful they are uh, with, these systems so you know we want it to be less about oh let me i see that you stole my flag because we actually had this system when we played defcon is we would be able to uh like jan said we were grepping for our own flags when we saw them going out of our pcaps we were able to take that actually just the pcap we'd drop it into a folder and then we'd replay that tr network traffic against the other teams and if they stole the flag we would submit it and we were able to actually get points and play the game without knowing anything about this service, how it worked, anything, right? So we really were standing on the poor backs of those uh, reverse engineers and those vulnerability analysis uh, people who did that time and that effort. And so we really wanted to switch the game more less from network analysis and more to raw pwning, hacking, uh, exploiting skills. Yeah, And so that's why we said, hey, we'll only release PCAPs when the service is close to being retired. And that was the big kind of change that we created. So that was uh, the, the change last year, or the, the year before last, when we took over hosting. Um, and there was this comment that, you know, it's, it is a bit of a bummer to lose that aspect, right? Because, you know, PCAPs would only come out uh, when the, the you know, after so much time that there's not really much you can do on this challenge anymore because everyone has patched it, everyone is exploiting it left and right. Um, and so we went back to the drawing board and we thought, how can you make this sort of network analysis um, challenging, useful, and uh, kind of not just uh, something that you can show up with a completed system and just turn it on like we, we did so many years um, yeah, so then you only have to be slightly better than the second best than the best hacker right exactly. because you steal all their exploits you do one of your own and then bam you're in first yeah and 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 we had years where our exploit replay system was embarrassingly enough responsible for the majority of our our points right so uh we came up with this stealth system where um the inspiration for this was uh, Phineas Fisher. If, if you haven't uh, looked this up, Phineas Fisher is a hacker who, um, the hacker who hacked hacking team and leaked all of their data on the internet. It's a really fascinating write-up that they wrote about this process, right? And what really struck me, uh, you can just search for it um, online. I have some of my slides from um, my various courses online and and there are links to this um there or you can just ping me i'll send you a link to to their write-up phineas fisher as part of the the process of hacking hacking team did this hyper careful exfiltration of data um to hide their presence right and this hyper careful ex uh, exfiltration of data had a cost and the cost in in that case was bandwidth right they could exfiltrate tons and tons of data uh because that's noisy uh, so there's this trade-off in um, these sort of exploitation scenarios often between stealth and um, just just raw power or whatever, right? Raw uh, effectiveness, uh, short-term effectiveness. And we tried to capture that in the stealth system for DEF CON um, more explicitly than, than um, has been in the past. Every um, challenge has two endpoints. One of these endpoints when you communicate with that challenge, you do not leak your network traffic to the victim team that you're exploiting, but any exploits you run are only worth half points. 
right? And so it takes you twice as long to achieve the same result, just as it took Phineas Fisher much longer to leak uh, the data and, and so on, um, and a lot of different examples. Uh, so this is the, the first year with this system. Um, and so far, it's really interesting. Uh, we're seeing a very interesting mix of, of course, we see all the traffic, uh, stealth traffic, non-stealth traffic. Uh, the, the Can't team. hide from the order. Exactly. Um, it has been super interesting to watch, you know, the type of traffic that, you know, teams probe publicly and then they exploit stealthily and sometimes the other way around because sometimes the probes are what's, uh, what's, what's. Yeah, maybe you want to throw off people's analysis or whatever. So you want to force them to have more PCAPs to look at. So, yeah, it's a really interesting dynamic that gets put in the player's mind of what do I actually do? Which, which traffic do I make? And the other awesome thing that, that we were excited about, it makes network analysis critically important because you need to understand, should you stealth based on the state of what everyone else is, is uh, doing as well. Okay, uh, so quick question, Jan, I think for the, for the end, um, there's a good question in the CTF discussion text about essentially about the spirit. And we do, I know I get this a lot. I'm sure you get this a lot. So how do I get started in CTF? So I've just been listening to Zardist. I am super stoked about CTF. I know some stuff. How do I get started? Awesome. I'm glad you asked. So uh, historically, I have told people um, just show up to CTFs, but, but this is a very painful process. Um, but it's important. Showing up is important. I mean, that's like there, there's no way literally a skill. That. Absolutely. There's no way to avoid that, but there is a way to make it less painful initially. Um, what I've seen is there are people that can show up to CT apps and just lose over and over and over and over for months. And then they start solving something and solving something and solving something more. And then they get rolling, right? There are people like that, but, but the majority of really potentially talented hackers uh, get discouraged through this process. So uh, Adam and I are both professors at Arizona State University. Um, and we thought about this problem a lot because uh, undergrads come to us and are like, how can I hack? How can I hack? And we tell them, okay, join ASU's uh, CTF team um, and, and uh, you know, hack with us. But people get discouraged. So uh, we have a number of uh, resources at ASU. I'll talk about one right now, um, and it is called pwn.college. Let me bring it up on the, the stream. I can do it on mine, or you, or you got it. Oh, yeah, go for it. Do you have a Pwn College account? Uh, I think I hacked one earlier. No, I actually don't. <laughs> Make something up. All right, so I brought up Pwn.college. As you can see, we really like this um, uh, hacker uh, theme. Uh, Pwn College is a educational framework for uh, cybersecurity, and specifically the, the type of cybersecurity that um, is very easy to approach in terms of moving into CTF, um, binary analysis, which I love. Might not be the easiest thing. So this is uh, the course I teach undergrads. Um, and I took a completely uh, established course at ASU, I threw it out and I remade it from scratch to be a CTF course. Um, I created a bunch of different individual modules that students who have zero knowledge, people coming into this course, typically don't even know how to use Linux on the command line. And that's fine because we have a module that requires you to use Linux on the command line. Um, there's a bunch of modules and these modules have documentation, slides, and uh, before next semester, I'll have videos up. Uh, that's my plan for uh, losing sleep after DEF CON. But let me show you the challenges, which is the heart of the system. So we go to ctf.pwn.college here. You can click uh, register or log in. And it shows you the challenges. These challenges are for the various modules. You say, OK, I'm uh, interested in uh, learning how to abuse set UID binaries, or I'm interested in learning how to uh, escape jails, you know, like CH simple Not CH. Not like a real jail. You have to go to the lockpicking village for that. Exactly. 
which I highly recommend. But you can uh, do lock finger, uh, uh, whatever, software gels. Um, how to write shell code, how to write, uh, like, how to reverse engineer binaries to write key generators, et cetera, et cetera. And you say, okay, well, here's like the set UID um, challenge. And then you choose a challenge. Set UID, set UID is special because basically these are all the various utilities in Linux, and you have to use them to leak out a flag. Um, and we can, uh, actually, let's, let's, leave that as an exercise for the reader. What's a nice, easy one? Uh, we will do uh, like one of the shell coding challenges. So here's a bunch of challenges, right? The idea is practice makes perfect. So you can go from zero to hero, step by step by step. And the other idea is these challenges will teach you how to solve them. So you click this teaching challenge, that's 23 solves a platform wise, and you can do this right now and say, okay, Let's uh, practice doing this challenge. You click here, it waits and say, okay, hey, you can now SSH in. You can set a private key in the config or you can just click terminal right here and it'll actually take you right to a terminal where you can start interacting with the chat. And here is uh, the challenge dropped into uh, a running Linux box that you're SSH into through your browser. I don't know if it's just me, but I can't hear you. Yeah, it's really tricky to handle this text uh, first to talk uh, along with uh, the router. So anyways, uh, this teaching challenge explains what you're trying to do, explains where memory is mapped, et cetera, et cetera, reads in input, and then you can. I can, can hear you. Yeah, he's, uh, he's got a baby at home, so there may be. Uh... He's, he's deliberately not pushing the talk, but so you can kind of read the screen a little bit. So it's telling oh, you that it's mapped. What? Right. That so was a reading problem. I, I, I hit F2, F. Uh, Man, are you messing with Pulse Audio again? Everyone knows you don't never worry. mess with Pulse don't worry Audio. We're back. We're back. All right. Anyways, so this uh, teaching challenge will tell you all about the constraints. So you don't have to reverse engineer it. And then it'll ask you for shell code and it lost connection. But let me show you what happens when I uh, get my connection back and then enter some shell code. So I just hand type some x86 assembly. Obviously, it's meaningless. And it disassembles your assembly and tells you this is what you input. And then it'll run it and tells you, hey, you know, you crashed. The awesome thing in practice mode, I can debug it. it. Yeah, that's because that's capital P. So you can remember that. <laughs> if you wanted to write other stuff, I don't remember. Uh, is this the meaning of the name PPP? It's just push RAX, push RAX, push RAX. <laughs> Um, the awesome thing, of course, it's a CTF uh, challenge. You need to ca uh, cap a flag. So let me cap the flag because I'm in practice mode. I can actually see what the flag is. So then when I debug this challenge and, and step uh, through it, I can figure out that it's working or not. Right, so this is a practice flag of all zeros. So then for some challenges, like the reversing challenges that read in the flag and then do crazy stuff on that, you can actually single step through them in a debugger in practice mode. And then you can't do that in, in a real mode because there is no pseudo. You have to actually solve the challenge. But it's the same challenge. So you can uh, practice your exploit, figure out what's wrong with it, debug it, and then run it. Um, I'll show one more thing. We partnered with uh, a company called Vector35 to give everyone a binary reverse engineering um, uh, tool that they could use to actually look at these challenges. And I'll show you that right now.
Come on, man. You don't know how to do pop-ups correctly? Hey, it's not me. It's, uh... <laughs> I blame my student. What is this, the 90s? <laughs> Anyway, you click a button and then the pop-up blocker that never runs has to stop it. Exactly. You click that um, and it will open it up. I don't have a Binary Ninja account at the moment here. Um, and it will open it up in Binary Ninja, which is like, you know, Ida Pro, which is kind of the, the standard tool for reverse engineering. Uh, but it works in your browser. So as you can see, you can do all of this in your browser. Honestly, I didn't mean to go on a sales pitch of this. I was just really excited about the platform. And Adam brought up, how do you uh get into ctf this is one way right why uh look at the slides watch those lectures they'll go online in a, a couple of weeks and then um I the other important thing that you mentioned sorry is uh you know i think it's I, it's really important to do a combination of things right like jan said show up to ctfs find a group if you don't have a group find a ctf group there's a ctf team called open to all which is literally open to everyone i mean find a group go to CTFs, be lost, be okay being lost. Jan and I were those people sitting in that room at CTF looking at a challenge going, I have no effing idea how I could possibly solve this. But you try and you try and you try for eight hours and you probably fail and failure is okay. And then the really important thing is to always go back and learn how did people solve those challenges. So this is a great community of CTF write-ups that and the problem with CTF's write-ups is they don't show you all of the headbanging that the author had to do against the wall in order to solve the challenge. They show you the beautiful golden path that gets you the flag. So it's important to keep that in mind, but learn from those write-ups. And then at the same time, while you're competing in CTFs, do these kind of training activities. There's Ponable.kr. There's uh, a lot of really good over the wire type resources that are amazing. Jan's going to put up his war game in that uh, browser there. So he has, if you go to github.com slash Zardis slash war game dash Nexus, it's a list of all these different types of CTF challenges and all the different categories. You want to get better at web. You want to get better at binaries. You want to get better at reversing. You can go here and really honestly, you know, it's on you. You have to, if you put in the time and the effort, I guarantee you, you will be a good CTF player and a good poner exploiter reverser whatever you want to be um so yeah take advantage of those opportunities for sure absolutely um adam and i our mission with even with everything with defcon etc is is has a strong educational component so if you're interested uh about learning about this stuff um and we do other stuff we do uh, academic research into cybersecurity. um i'm one of the founders of uh, binary analysis engine called anger uh, if you're interested in any of these concepts, just contact us, ask us a question. We're pretty friendly. I guess we'll be on the Discord now. Be on the Discord now. All right. Um, come see us tomorrow for our uh, sync up, uh, our recap at 1 p.m. PM. And otherwise, um, if Wait, you don't, don't, the kid, go ahead. don't the kids say like and subscribe? Isn't there some way they can give us social right. capital or money or something? Yeah, I think it's here maybe, or I don't know there's, Discord. Maybe it's just say thanks at whatever, and some random bot will give you rep. I, don't know. I think you can turn in the rep for like food or something, maybe. Yeah. How about this? You can just get us a beer at the next DEF CON. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Feel free to reach out with questions. Otherwise, uh, if you're playing the game, keep playing. Otherwise, see you at the next sync up. Um, hi, I have a question. Uh, yeah. What do you think yeah. of starting CTF, learning CTF and reverse engineering by first learning assembly and not just digging into like, what do you think should be like learned first assembly or without knowledge of assembly? starting doing reverse engineering and getting along thanks that's a, that's a great question um yeah you probably have a i would say both that one i mean i'm more of like a choose your own whatever honestly i mean a lot of this stuff is interest so if like you if you find yourself reversing binaries for hours it probably means you like reverse engineering and you're going to be good at it eventually um and then you know, once you learn one assembly language, it's actually pretty easy to pick up another one and understand what's going on on ARM or MIPS or whatever. I mean, it's just different ways of thinking. So in my mind, it's like, it's nice to have a base of knowledge. So you know what you're looking at and you know what the tools are, you know how to use object dump. It's nice if you're able to write a, a, an assembly program.
to, to do something, but then doing both, I think is really good. Like, you know, improving your reverse engineering skills by looking at, uh, binaries. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do you think, Jan? So I actually think, um, I'm going to take the opportunity to answer a slightly different question. I think all of computer science should start from the lower level up. I, uh, right now we teach kids uh, Python first or Java even worse, right, first and so forth. I think it would be much more helpful to start with logic gates and build up on solid principles the understanding of what a computer is. And then you can start from the game of life. Boom. And then you can uh, really go in depth into uh, um, hacking right away, you know, into reverse engineering because you've just done the whole, you know, uh, process from logic gates up and then you can kind of go back down. Um, so from that perspective, uh, I would say learning assembly and then applying it is great. I'll give a caveat. My class where I learned assembly, I went to uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute for undergrad. Um, they, back then, uh, CTF- Did they even use security there? Well, Are you so old? That was before security. Uh, I, I, I think, I think uh, RIT has a security club. No, um, so RPI is actually now competing in uh, DEF CON uh, with, you know, they're, they're one of the teams. Um, let's see what place they were at. A place, uh, top 16, I think. Yeah. Top 16. So right now RPI sec is in like 10th place, but you know, they're, uh, they're, they're hanging in there. Um, at RPI, the computer organization class, which is what you typically take as a sophomore, uh, was basically x86 assembly and then hacking, reverse engineering, et cetera. And x86 assembly was almost an excuse to get to the hacking. Um, and that, for me, was the perfect way to learn x86 assembly. I learned it through hacking challenges. Oh, I mean, sure, there was like one homework assignment where it's like write a function. And then it's like, OK, now here is a, a binary bomb, reverse engineer it to figure out an input to diffuse it. That was awesome. So I would recommend trying to do something very similar. Um, I'll, I'll do another sales pitch plug. Um, a group of RPI SEC alumni, uh, RPI alumni, I was never an RPI SEC, it didn't exist back when I was in college, but a group of uh, fellow RPI and alumni founded a platform called War Games, which lets you, again, in your browser, get familiar with uh, assembly uh, and reverse engineering and even exploitation. Uh, look it up. Um, it, the company is uh, Red2 Systems, the platform is War Games. Yeah, and I think they, you know, the, I don't know, I, a lot of this stuff is transferable. I feel, I think it's like programming languages a lot of the time is like, you know, you get really good in one language and you can go into another language and write, you know, throw down code there because you can, you don't, it's not because you know it, that language. It's because like when we're debugging one of our team members crazy Ruby code and I haven't written Ruby code in over a decade, and it's like, oh, I can kind of read it and then I can Google for how do I do a list in Ruby? Um, and the other thing actually that I've found, I don't know if Jan has found this, but uh, you know, there is a lot of truth to this adage of like, you really don't understand something until you have to teach it. And so like my actually background in CTS was all web security stuff. But when I started, uh, when I became a professor and I started teaching how to do binary exploitation, that made me understand it at such a deep level that now I, I really have a much, much, much better handle on it than I ever had. Um, so, I, you know, you can even apply that in like a CTF context, right? If you have a CTF team, organize regular meetings and be the person that is presents, go through the latest, um, God, I hate all those, the house of whatever heap exploits or yeah. even start small at, at whatever level makes sense. But like, you know, break a problem down when you really start looking at it and say, how do I explain this to somebody else? You really have to understand it. Yeah, and I'll, I'll uh, elaborate on this house of uh, whatever. So there's a class of uh, exploits, like a whole genre of exploitation called uh, heap, heap exploits. techniques, right? Heap techniques, yeah. So by um, misusing or causing a program to misuse uh, dynamic allocators, you can do crazy stuff, right? And uh, achieve uh, execution and, 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 and so forth and then. Um, this used to be just like a, a completely opaque magic. Uh, 
um, to me and to my teammates back when uh, I was uh, hacking with Shellfish um, before uh, we decided to host the CTF with Order of the Overflow. Um, and back then we created something, uh, we had a hacking meeting in Santa Barbara and then we created an offshoot and we said, this is gonna be the heap exploitation uh, meetings. And we just took turns teaching each other various heap exploitation techniques and to teach it through that, that process. None of us knew them. Through that process, we learned them uh, well enough that Shellfish's how to heap repository is like a de facto source of knowledge for um, heap exploitation nowadays. Um, I absolutely support, I, I would generalize it. If you really want to learn something in a very deep level, go one step beyond, whether that step is not just learning, but teaching, or whether that step is learning something that uh, depends on what you wanted to learn. So like you said, reverse engineering. If if you push through and become a good reverse engineer, you will understand assembly for sure. Yeah, that's, I, there's no way. <laughs> So things that kind of are dry and boring on their own, uh, like the inner workings of a dynamic allocator suddenly might become very exciting in a different context as a base for something. And then it helps you, I feel like, in learning a new weird system, right? So there's a new weird, maybe it's a different allocation system, maybe it's something else, but you know, you've studied a system to understand what kind of primitives it allows you to do, those types of things that you can apply that mindset to this new domain. Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, cool. looking. Right, we got to get back to CCF yeah. admining. <laughs> yeah, all right. sorry to keep, uh, cut this short, but um, we'll, we're here. Feel free to just uh, PM us at, at any point, or you can, of course, also um, uh, shoot us an email. Our contact info is, is, is quite public. Uh, look up overflow.io, and then there's a team list there. Um, Ping us on Discord, uh, drop into the next uh, recap. Uh, and uh, yeah, hope to see those of you who aren't hacking in our CTF this year, hacking in our CTF in the future. Especially if somebody else is hosting. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Ciao. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.